All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Toring. I'm the Administrative Assistant to the uh, Executive Vice President of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. And I want to uh, welcome you all to this evening's uh, webinar. Very happy that you are interested in the ACVPM and potentially taking the uh, board certification exam in 2022. Um, what we wanna do this evening is just go over the application process and give you some hints on uh, how to complete the application, uh, show you the timeline, and uh, just get any, uh, any questions that you might have of us uh, as you go through this process. I've got uh, three speakers this evening, or three panelists. I've got uh, uh, Dr. Todd French, who's the outgoing chair of our credentials committee. I've got Dr. Matt Doyle, who is a counselor on our executive board. And I have Danelle Bickett-Whittle, Dr. Danelle Bickett-Whittle, who is a uh, immediate past president of the ACVPM. Uh, Drs. Doyle and Bickett-Whittle are uh, very experienced at sponsoring applicants, so they have seen quite a few applications, so uh, their input will, will be uh, invaluable. Uh, we will allow for question and answers, uh, the Q&A feature in the Zoom platform. If you have a question, just type it in there. I'll be monitoring those questions. Uh, some questions we may ask, answer along the way, and others we may wait until the end to answer those questions. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. French, who is our uh, Credentials Committee Chairperson. Thank you so much, Dr. Toring, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, logging in tonight uh, to join into this webinar. Um, we get, uh, the Credentials Committee, just to kind of orient you, are the ones that uh, review all applications submitted for the exam uh, and determine if the applica applicant is qualified to, uh, to sit for uh, the exam. Uh, we'll talk about dates and, and, and times, um, but this is, right now we're talking about the 22, 2022 exam, which is in June of next year, and we're currently uh, in the application window, and we're about to enter the submission window. Again, we'll go over that. So we get a lot of questions. Um, through the through the Gmail uh, and through uh, college members who are sponsoring and mentoring, asking, "Hey, you know, I've got this potentially unique situation, which turns out to be not so unique because we get the questions a lot." Um, so th hopefully, this webinar will help you an help answer some of those questions that you guys have right now. Now, there's going to be some very specific questions, and as Dr. Toring said, we'll we will address everything that that comes our way. Um, if not on the, the webinar this evening. If we see it, we'll, we'll do it through emails if it's super specific. Um, but yeah, we're, we're here, uh, we're, we're open um, uh, for, for these questions. Uh, and especially uh, Dr. Bickett Whittle and Dr. Doyle as sponsors can help members who are sponsoring individuals, talk to them and help guide them through the process. So in addition to this presentation, uh, we encourage you to go to the ACVPM website. I know Dr. Torn will say it several times and it was in the invitation email. Uh, so acvpm.org and review the information under the ex ACVPM uh, exam tab. Um, you'll find this is where you'll find the requirements to apply, costs, frequently asked questions. Uh, and here's a big plug for the frequently asked questions. So we update that every year. When we did this webinar two years ago, um, we got a lot of great questions that we were able to really update the frequently asked questions and uh, really help out applicants who are seeking to apply. So um, those questions, if we haven't already addressed them, we'll go into this next FAQ. So I encourage you to go and, and, and look at it uh, and, and again, ask questions so we can help you out as well. So this is actually the 2022 exam. Apologies, I, I meant to go in and uh, I corrected most of them, but I missed one. Uh, so applying for the 2022 exam, you have to be a veterinary uh, graduate or equivalent. So we say DVM or equivalent. So that doesn't just mean, you know, v, VMD if you come from uh, Penn, but it also means uh, a DVM equivalent from around the world because this is a, an international um, uh, college. Uh, we pride ourselves on that, um, but you have to meet certain requirements uh, in order to apply for the exam. Um, so that's a big one. We'll talk a little bit about that, more about that in a minute, as well as have a history of unquestionable moral character and professional behavior, uh, which is proven through two letters of reference and a sponsor form. So we always get questions about letters of reference, and I'll go ahead and address that now. 
these letters of reference aren't like I'm applying to veterinary school or I'm applying for a residency program letters of reference, right? So there's not that, you know, page long. Um, this is, you know, my interactions with the individual. Our references are unique. Um, we we uh, design them um, to uh, be easily fillable by your references and to serve as uh, moral and character references. So you're gonna tell us what you do. And we're, as a committee, uh, we're gonna sit down and look through the qualifying experience and say, yeah, this meets the qualifying experience part, your references and your sponsor are gonna say, yep, they've got good moral character. I think they would be a good fit for the college based on these interactions I've had with them related to veterinary preventive medicine. Um, so I think it's important to say that because every year we'll get some some letters. So we'll have the reference form and then it says see attached and sure enough there's a Word document or PDF um, that's attached that has the letter of reference. You know, we typically have to send those back if they if our references aren't signed in the places where we need them to be signed or initialed. So we hate to make people do more work than necessary. Um, but uh, that, that's part of the application. So in addition, you have to have minimum of four years post DVM experience. And this is super important. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that. So this is, this is what we're measuring. The most important thing we're looking for when we see applications is that four years post DVM, is, DVM experience. Um, and that's what we're actually sitting down and we're accounting. And this is the, the main point we can get out of here tonight is, is, have answer your questions and it and show you how to fill out that qualifying experience form. All applicants must be sponsored by ACVPM uh, diplomats in good standing. And so uh, Dr. Bickett Weddle and Dr. Doyle will talk with you about that later. There is a, a, an exam fee of $625 um, that you need to pay before uh, um, upon submission of the application. So um, just so you know, we'll say it a, f a few times. If you submit the application, your application is rejected, you only get 50% of that fee back. So again, we're here tonight to, to show you how to submit a s strong uh, application and make sure that that application uh, will we'll pass through our committee uh, and, and get you to the exam. If there's some questions, um, we'll talk about how to address those before you submit just to, to make sure that you're ready. A little bit more about the committee. So we're a five-member committee. We're staggered. Uh, uh, so I am the the current president, but I'm going to hand over to Dr. Jenna Wiebeck um, at the uh, when we do our annual meeting at the end of July, and she will be chair then. So we serve five-year terms. We have a variety of different backgrounds, and we're, and each applicant, each time we accept a new member onto the committee, we want to make sure they're representing uh, something that we we see in the college. So military, government, industry, small animal, large animal, academic, these are a lot of the qualifications we're looking for in a credentials committee because I know a lot of you out there are across that spectrum. So we wanna make sure that someone can look at your application and say, yeah, I understand this unique perspective of you know, a specific small, an someone who's small animal predominant or someone who's in the military or government. So there's the member directory right there to find your sponsor. So is there an exam application portal, right? So this is what we, this is a breakdown of what we talked about on that first slide. Um, so you can go in and find everything you need to know about the uh, exam. You can have, uh, see diplomat resources, um, read that FAQ, find out what the college is. Um, you know, a lot of you are on here for, you know, not really knowing much about the college. So it's important to, you know, see what the college is and see if this is, um, if you're a good candidate uh, to apply for the exam and see if this is a community you want to be part of. I'm super biased, but this is an amazing community. So come be a part of it. Uh, before you submit, again, I talked to, about this a little bit. We want to make sure you get those questions answered though. And, and that happens in several ways. One, this webinar and those who aren't on, who you know, who want to see it, we're going to record it so they can watch it later. The questions that come through the FAQ, the questions that you're going to submit tonight, and then you can ask members. You know, if you know a member of the college, even if they're not your sponsor, if they're a mentor, you can ask them, "Hey, I've got a question related to the application process. Um, I want to make sure that I'm 
you know, submitting an application that's going to, you know, pass through the committee. What do you think about this? Uh, you can also ask us questions of the committee. What we can't do is review an application. So if you send an application in and say, hey, can you review this to say that it's good or not? We can't do that. Uh, we have to do that once it's submitted formally. But before you get to that point, there are a lot of steps you can do. We're, we're here to help. Um, we always, you know, we want uh, uh, good applicants. Um, we're advocating for you. So we'll, we'll try to get all those questions answered. And that's one of the questions that we get a lot. As the chair, um, as I'm monitoring the email, um, I get uh, questions, a lot of questions related to, hey, can you review this application um, before I submit it? So just wanted to mention that's something that we can't do. So here's our timeline. As you see, we're already in this first uh, window here. So June, between June and July 31st, register for, for a login to acvpm.org. So that is everything. You can't get an application. You can't do anything until you do that. So it's important that you do that. Um, next, uh, download the application reference and sponsor forms. Dr. Toring has made it very easy um, over the past few years to go in and get all that information in one packet with instructions. Uh, identify a sponsor. Again, must be an ACVPM diplomat in good standing who can guide you through the process. And then we've got this uh, 1st through 31st August, when you can actually submit the application, the last day is 31 August um, to submit the application. Uh, after that, we, we cannot take any application. So um, if you, you know, we've got some people who forgot, oh, I forgot that this was this month and, and, and um, but we just, it's, a, it's our deadline. <laughs> um, before we kind of had a rolling deadline that was a little bit before, but 30, 31 August is, is gonna be our deadline. So again, that's another question we get kind of after the fact. And then between one September and 30 November, typically uh, right before the Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving holidays, we'll have all the applications um, that have been submitted, uh, that Dr. Toring has, has worked with the applicants to, um, to you know, make sure they, they got submitted They're in a repository and that's when we'll do our review. And applicants are typically notified um, before uh, the Thanksgiving holiday, but if not um, before December. So here's what you're here for, qualifications to apply. So in order to apply, uh, you have to have a degree in veterinary medicine or an ECFVG certificate or licensed to practice veterinary medicine, right? So uh, again, we'll break that down a little bit, more, but we give you several, uh, several windows to apply because we know that in some individuals who are applying do not have, um, did not graduate from AVMA uh, accredited college. Uh, again, unquestionable moral character and professional behavior. You have to have four years of combined qualifying experience post-veterinary graduation by the application deadline, and that has to come in three or more areas of veterinary preventive medicine. So one of the reasons that we decided to re-host this webinar that we uh, initially hosted it in 2019, because there's been a change here. So um, originally we had five areas of veterinary preventive, preventive medicine we're focusing in. Um, the, the college members and the executive board uh, voted to change that, to, to uh, broaden that, to better uh, reflect um, what the college uh, was about and stood for. So now there's six areas. So that just means there, you have an extra area to, uh, to uh, get experience in. So we'll discuss that in some detail next. So there are three ways to meet the education and licensure requirements. So one is be an AVMA accredited DVM or equivalent degree, right? So veterinary schools in the United States, outside of the United States, if you go to the AVMA, um, you can see which, uh, which institutions are accredited. If you graduated from AVMA created, uh, accredited uh, uh, veterinary school, that is all you need to submit. Okay, we'll talk about what documents we need, but that is all you need to uh, submit to us. You are qualified for, edu for the education piece just with the, uh, a photocopy of that diploma. So, or if you graduated from uh, an institution that requires the ECFVG, you submit your, uh, that certificate along with the uh, diploma of where you graduated from or indicated where you graduated from. Or 
if you're licensed to practice veterinary medicine in a state, province, territory, U.S., or other country. So that encompasses a lot, right? So again, we are an international college. So we have applicants from all over the world uh, and, and, and veterinary equivalent programs from all over the world. Not AVMA accredited, not required to take the ECVFG to, to, to practice where they uh, are practicing. Um, so in those cases, we request a license uh, to practice veterinary medicine. So just to mention here, you know, if you graduated from AVMA accredited program and you also have a license um, to practice, let's say a state license, we don't need both of those. You guys are going to submit them anyway, and that's perfectly fine. But if you have the AVMA uh, accredited DVM uh, diploma or transcript, if you can't remember where you hid the diploma in your attic, that's all you need. You don't need to uh, attach the license um, as well, but we're going to get them and we're okay with that, right? Better to have uh, more on that than less. Now, don't send your diploma and your transcripts and your license and, you know, a letter from your neighbor and all that. We, Dr. Toring will, will send those back. Um, but this is a, a question we, we consistently get is, do I need my license and my diploma from AV, AVMA accredited um, institution? No, you just need one. So education uh, described in table one. So here's just a, uh, some uh, screen grabs of what that will look like. So again, I'm not going to I think I beat this horse. I think it is dead. I know some people here can save it, but I'm, I, I, I think we beat this horse to death. <laughs> In addition, education, you can uh, provide um, information on the optional list of, uh, of, of programs that you've attended in PH, MS, PhD, residency that are applicable to the six specialty veterinary preventive medicine uh, areas in, in college. Um, uh, that the college recognizes. Um, you would also put that information in table one. So just to let you know that those degrees count only count towards qualifying experience if you've obtained them after your veterinary degree. So I know there's a lot of dual programs, um, dual MPH DVM programs, PhD DVM <laughs> programs. If, if those dual programs, that experience won't count towards qualifying experience if it's obtained at the same time must be uh, post. And that also uh, uh, correlates to uh, degrees that you got before you went to veterinary school. If you got your MPH before you went to vet school, that MPH won't count towards qualifying experience. I'll talk about how we consider those degrees, but it's important to, to let you know it doesn't count towards that qualifying experience because we'll, we'll get that information. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more in a bit about how that counts. If you're full-time, if you're part-time, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So described on table two is license to practice. So license to practice veterinary medicine in a state, province, territory, U.S., or other country. So it, it says in table two, if you have submitted your um, AVMA accredited uh, 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 diploma, you do not have to submit this, okay? Um, again, we'll see them anyway, um, but just to let you know, you don't have to submit it if you submitted that diploma. The license has to be valid and it's based on the, uh, the application date. So what does that mean? So if you see this, um, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor here, but if you see this certificate of licensure in the state of, state of South Dakota, so that is a licensure in the state of South Dakota, but it does not have a current date on it. It doesn't say I am currently licensed to practice. So that's not a valid date. However, if you look right here, there's an invalid valid on the application date. So there was also a license submitted, just the pocket license that said, hey, uh, Dr. Bickett Weddle is licensed to practice, um, expires in this time frame, and as long as that time frame occurs uh, uh, before the application date, then the applicant would be good to go. We get a lot of questions on this, under understand. We'll get a lot of emails and that's, we're gonna answer them. Um, we're also in the FAQ. Uh, so just so you know, I, I know it sounds a little confusing, but we're going to get you there. 
So I mentioned this earlier too, unquestionable moral character and professional behavior. And, and how do we, we find that as a college? And we're kind of the initial gatekeepers of the credentials committee. Um, so we, we do that by you know, requiring you to have a sponsor. So someone is in good standing who says, yes, this person would be a good applicant, not just based on the qualifying experience that I know they have, but also based on um, how I know this as uh, I know this person and I know they have good moral, um, good moral character and professional behavior. They would be a good uh, member of the college references as well. So they are not, they are not required to be diplomates or even veterinarians. Um, your sponsor can also be a reference. So if you have your uh, a sponsor, they can be a reference as, as, as well. Just wanted to mention that. So we get some kind of out there examples. We had a CrossFit coach a couple of years ago. We had, oh, this is my, this is my friend that I grew up with in grade school. So those people can attest to, to, to moral character, but we, we discourage um, non-professional references, right? So it can be a peer, it can be someone who can attest to your good moral character, um, but we would prefer, um, we will prefer individuals who've worked with you in a professional setting uh, who can attest to that, that character. So here are the reference, uh, reference form. So the applicant fills out the name exactly as it will appear at top of each page of the application form. Let me make sure this arrow shows up there. So that's important. Why is that important? Because you might have a reference or a sponsor who is um, going to sponsor several applicants. We wanted, we want them to, uh, you want them to know that they are managing the correct application. We've got some crossed wires before in the past where we've gotten, you know, one page from one reference and another page from another reference for a diff completely different candidate. Um, so that's why we have you do that. And that's why we, we mention it here. So this form uh, is completed by the reference. Okay. So not by you, it's completed by the reference. Uh, em uh, employer, supervisor, training, program, other. There's a, a box down here that speaks to that. Let me see if I can get my cursor on here again. So it says, if you were a training program director, did the applicant successfully complete the program? So this is only, this is a narrow window, okay? So we, you know, if the person was, you know, the, um, the, the, your training program director for your MPH or your residency or a PhD, they would fill something out here. If not, it's gonna be, just leave this empty. Um, because if you click no, uh, we'll have to look through to say, because no says, please explain, right? So the reason that this is here is so that the, um, if that person is a training program director, they can say they didn't complete this because of these reasons, right? I'm there in the middle of it, or um, there was a break for, you know, whatever reasons, right? Um, if the person is not a training program coordinator, they can skip over this. That's a, a, a frequent, uh, uh, we frequently have to, recheck those boxes. And again, a test of moral and ethical character. So that's the first, first form on that page. So the second form is they are going to, I'm sorry, not the second form, but the second page, uh, they are, are going to be the ref, it's going to be the reference. So again, we have applicant name. Uh, so they're going to attest to veterinary preventive medicine, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So we have the six areas on here. Um, this is an expandable form. They do not have to have observed you in all six areas. They could have minimally observed you in a few areas or like, hey, we, we primarily did surveillance, prevention, management, control of diseases. So that's how I'm gonna attest. And, it, and again, we're not looking for those, you know, page long reference uh, forms, two page long reference forms. We're looking for, you know, them to, to, to quickly say, hey, this is, um, this is where, uh, this is how I can attest to um, the moral character and the abilities of the applicant. Uh, within a, uh, within this certain time frame right here. So I, I think that's important because as you hand these references off, we'll get a lot of questions from references that say, how long does this need to be? 
And we say, well, as long as you need it to be, but here's what we need you to do. A test a moral character and, and you know, a test that the applicant is a good fit uh, for the college in these uh, veterinary preventive medicine specialty areas. And so we've got here limit to three pages or less. Must be signed by the reference. Um, and describe responsibilities, professional experiences, courses, projects. If there's something that's not observed, just have them put not observed, not applicable in there. I'm going to talk a little bit about the sponsor, um, just the uh, logistical part of what the sponsor will fill out. But again, Dr. Bickett Weddle and Dr. Doyle will talk at the end of the presentation, uh, get into a little bit more detail. So again, applicant fills out names. We appreciate Dr. Turing putting that in here as many times as he has. Um, form is completed by the sponsor. So uh, again, not by the applicant, not by the reference, by the sponsor. A test of moral and ethical character. Uh, and, and that's where we're check they're checking the boxes right here. It's important that they remember to check the boxes. If there's no box check and applicant is of good moral, moral character, um, then that tells us kind of the opposite, right? And what typically happens is, and usually not with our sponsors because they've sat for the exam, they, uh, they've been through the process, but it has changed, the application has changed over the years. Typically what we will see is no boxes checked and just a signature, or they'll try to convert it to a, a Word document signed and the formatting doesn't work and the Xs don't show up. So here's a plug for the only way that these applications can be submitted is in a PDF form and they'll be submitted all in one document. And, and there's some verbiage on um, some request sheets that will uh, say that towards the end. Again, form must be signed. One of the main things we send applications back for is because the reference form hasn't been signed. And there's some initial blocks as well. So really read those forms. Sponsor responsibilities. Again, I'm gonna let um, uh, the docs take this towards the end. Um, but here it is on the screen so you can read. We talked about active ACVPM uh, member information source. Again, there we get we get a lot of questions from sponsors and we love it because sponsors are like, hey, I think this is how this works. This is how it worked before. I got a unique person. Is this how this works for them? So they can answer those questions for you without you having to try to describe your unique experience. Not just sponsor you for the application, but sponsor you once you're in the college. So now they're a source to let you know, hey, there's a lot of CE that we get uh, that ACVPM provides. Here's a lot of other organizations that they we work with. Here's other committees. Hey, come join committees, right? So um, to truly, uh, we want them to uh, be that relationship that truly welcomes you, welcomes you to the college. Qualifying experience. So. The Credentials Committee determines suitability of all experiences. And Dr. Bickett Weddle said this a couple years ago, and I, I think it's great. So what you're trying to do is convince five complete strangers that you are qualified to sit for this exam. So you're qualified because you have at least three or more. Uh, most, most people are able to look at their experience and say, hey, what I'm doing fits into more than three areas. It fits into all six areas. You're trying to convince us um, that you are going to be a good, uh, you're a good applicant and you would be a good member of the college um, and one that will, you know, further the, the, the college once you get in, right? Um, and then, so we're kind of those initial gatekeepers and then the maintenance and certification committee guys, we hand you off to them and they say, hey, Remember when you said you were gonna, these are, these are the things that you were important to you in veterinary preventive medicine. Um, we're gonna hold you to that. So at least four years of quali combined qualifying experience post-veterinary graduation as of exam application deadline. This changed a couple of years ago, but we wanna make sure that information is out there. It used to be as of the exam date. And then when we had that, what happened was some people would graduate in May, some would graduate in mid-June um, or some sometimes even July. And so there, they wouldn't have four, four years of qualifying experience by the, their graduation date. So we had a lot of provisional applications that became a whole thing. So we decided 
last year um, to say, hey, by the application deadline, which is 31 August, you need to have that four years of qualifying experience. So if you're a 2017 grad uh, and you are applying in for the 2022 exam, as long as you have four years, you just came hot out of vet school and went right into, you know, uh, fields of veterinary preventive medicine, as long as you have those four years um, straight up until you know, August, uh, uh, you know, before that August 31 deadline, then you would have the qualifying experience um, eligible to be examined by the committee to sit for the exam. Here's an example. So again, this is kind of based on last year's uh, exam, but we'll say this is 2017 to, uh, to uh, 2020, right? So graduated from ACVM accredited veterinary school, uh, begin full-time work. We consider full-time work 35 plus hours a week. Um, work two years in private practice doing VPM tasks. So, hey, private practice, right? You're in private practice, you're doing a lot of VPM tasks. And if that turns to be your passion and that's your focus, tell us, explain to us on the, uh, on the, your application. Hey, I'm not just, you know, in private practice, um, you know, petting puppies all day long. This is what I'm doing to further the field of veterinary preventive medicine. This is what I'm doing with the shelters. This is what I'm doing um, for preventive medicine. These are the things I'm doing that qualify me to sit for this for the exam. So let's say if you're an individual who graduated, um, you began full time work, and then you took a little bit of a break. Uh, and then you pick back up work again. So if you see in these calculations, um, the, this applicant only has three years and nine months of experience, right? Because they chose to sit for the exam um, that occurred um, the year after they graduated, right? So the exam window closed, application window closed 31 August. So they would have had to have worked four years straight. They had a break and that break was enough to, uh, to, limit their qualifying experience. So they do not have four years of qualifying experience. This applicant would be disapproved to sit for the exam due to qualifying experience. And people ask, do we do the math? Yes, we do the math. There's at least four or five every year where we have to really sit down and do the math. So you convince us, you convince us that you have that time, you know, be honest and truthful. Um, but you convince us that you have that time based on full-time equivalents of 35 plus hours a week um, and, and, you know, let us go from there. But we've had some that have been a couple of months short for things like this. So this also doesn't mean that, hey, I work 80 hours a week, like we all do. <laughs> um, so I should be able to sit in two years. Nope, that doesn't count. So anything over 35 hours a week is just considered a, a, a full-time year, a full-time month, um, a full-time week. Sometimes people have to add weeks together. So just to, just to let you know, I know we're all working our tails off now, um, but if we're working 80 hours a week, it, it, it still only counts as that 40. You still need that four years of qualifying experience. Now in the FAQs, we uh, also break down kind of the math and not just for full-time, but also for, hey, what if I'm part-time? What if I'm only working 20 hours a week? Here's the math of how that works out. And, and here's what you need to do to get that four years of qualifying experience. So qualifying experience, advanced degrees, training programs may count. So master's doctoral degrees in preventive medicine, public health, relevant medic medical science. But again, has to be completed after that DVM or equivalent to count for qualifying experience after. It's the number one question we, we get, but it has to be completed after that experience because what the college is looking for is, you know, what have you done as a veterinarian uh, in the field of veterinary preventive medicine to further that field as a veterinarian um, and, and not before you're a veterinarian. You know, as we align with the American Board of Veterinary Specialists, you know, that's one of our, our, our requirements, right? So, after that uh, DVM or equivalent. So if you did an EP, MPH or PhD combined, we cannot count that towards qualifying experience, but as you tell us your qualifying experience, whether it be in, in you know, your postdoc or whether it be in clinical work or with the USDA or with whatever, we can look at that four years of qualifying experience and say, hey, the numbers add up. 
Um, uh, we're good to go. This, this individual has an MPH from previous or a PhD in a relevant field, um, which you know make, makes them a good applicant for the college. They've got the qualifying experience, everything else is in line. So that's just kind of, uh, yeah, you know, we, we as a committee um, understand this, this individual is um, uh, passionate enough about the field of veterinary preventive medicine to contribute to the college. So there are two ACVPM certified training residency programs currently at Ohio State University and the University of Minnesota. Um, so if you were in these programs, and this is a change this year. So if anyone is on the line in one of these programs, this is a change. So this year, if you were in the final year and you were in good standing with that program, then you were eligible to take the exam in that final year. So these are three-year programs, and we found that some individuals just, you know, graduate vet school, go right into these programs. They do the programs in three years, and hey, they're short that fourth year of qualifying experience. Um, so technically, they're not eligible to sit for the exam. So again, we mentioned this to the executive board, um, was put out a vote to the college as well to say, hey, do we need to change this to, to uh, give these uh, individuals uh, a leg up in applying for the exam and taking for the exam because taking the exam because their you know their whole lives are basically veterinary preventive medicine and these approved residency programs. So that is the case now. So if you're in the last year of again Ohio State or University of Minnesota, um, and uh, you can apply for the exam, and if you pass the exam as soon as you uh, graduate from the program, you will be admitted to the college uh, if you provide the correct documentation to the executive board. People ask about other training programs as well. We know there's a lot of other great training programs um, and, and uh, members of the, the college and other committees have been reaching out, uh, have been fielding uh, uh, emails and phone calls from these other training programs that say, hey, how do we get into this approved residency program? So just so you know, I know some of you are out there saying, hey, but I went to UC Davis and this, and I went here and this is a great program. Um, the, a lot of other, a lot of those other residency programs have been reaching out to the college to get approved, and that's in the process. But currently, we just have Ohio State and University of Minnesota. Dr. French, before we yes, move on, uh, very good question about qualifying experience. Uh, do you accept applications from veterinarians whose public health and epidemiology experience is primarily on the human health side? We have had this question before. Yes. So as you write out your qualifying experience, a lot of the, the, the public health um, focus, so you know anyone who's gone through MPH um, that wasn't associated with a veterinary school, which is the majority of us that have MPHs, you do a lot of curriculum in the, in the human field, right? So it's overall public health, overall policy, uh, but you, again, you're going to have to, to uh, as you submit your application, you're going to have to have done some veterinary work, right? So Dr. Bickett Weddle, who's our immediate past president, can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but if we had somebody that was just, hey, I've just worked with humans for four years and I haven't seen an animal in four years and I'm, you know, um, that might be on the edge. But otherwise, yes, that, that experience counts. Am I, am I speaking truth, Dr. Bickett Whittle? You definitely are. And I think the biggest thing to remember about this is you're trying to credential people to successfully pass the exam. And we don't ask human disease questions necessarily. So if you don't have, you know, fresh current animal things at the forefront, um, you'll probably struggle on significant portions of the exam because veterinary preventive medicine is what we do. So there are a significant number of animal related questions, regulatory surveillance concepts or concepts, right? Epidemiology, two by two tables, you know, prevalence, all of that. It doesn't matter if you're two-legged or four-legged, but we are veterinary preventive medicine. So we want to make sure that you've got the right experience coming in to be able to take this exam and stand up next to other diplomates that, that have that type of, of experience and, and essentially we're specialists. So great question. Thanks doc. Yes. Great question. And, and a, a super important re reminder. Yes. Yeah, so 
what, what you're applying for is to sit for this exam that is veterinary preventive medicine focused. Uh, so that is why we go through these applications. That is why we, uh, we have the requirements that we do because we want, ultimately want to make sure that the applicant is a, a, a good fit to sit for the exam and can hopefully be successful in the exam, right? Because we could just have everybody come and take the exam and take all the money, but we don't want to do that. Uh, we we want to make sure, we want to advocate for the applicant um, and, and, and make sure that those who are sitting for the exam can, can ultimately be in a position of success for the exam. Thanks, Doc. So demonstrating four years of qualifying experience, this is important. So this is what the, the what we spend the majority of our time as a committee is looking through these qualifying experience forms. So again, full time is at least 35 hours a week, um, if not extend the duration of experience. So if you did four years and one of those years was just part time, then you need extra time to, uh, to uh, be counted towards qualifying experience, either extra years or, hey, I was part-time um, working, but the other, you know, the other time I was taking an MPH, you know, I'm currently in an MPH program or I'm in this training program. It's unpaid, but I'm in this training program, which counts. Unpaid, as long as you're a veterinarian, if you go to a one-week course and you're trying to, to make sure you have a lot of hours, um, enough hours to, to qualify, put that one week course on there. If you're, you feel like, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, a little, might be a little short. Um, so any of that training, it doesn't have to be, uh, paid, um, but that's relevant to one of those six areas, please, uh, submit that. Um, and, and, but do it on a separate form, right? So you can fill out as many of these as you want to get to that four years of qualifying experience. Uh, a lot majority will have, more than four years. So we'll have, you know, a, a decade or, or longer, you know, five or six years where those forms will say, hey, I've worked for this same organization for the past five years and I've done these things and these percentages that relate to veterinary preventive medicine. And all we'll see is one form, uh, one qualifying experience form say, yep, yeah, that meets exactly what we need. Um, and they don't have to put the rest of that uh, experience. So this was a change. So uh, previous years, uh, again, we had five areas that we were looking at um, and the college voted to uh, change these, update these to better reflect the, uh, the priorities of the college and the college members. So this is currently what you will see on your qualifying experience form. So you will see, as you saw on the left, you will see a box Surveillance prevention management control of disease, which um, which mirrors exactly uh, what we've got here, right? So you will write what I did. Uh, I you know worked at a small animal clinic, um, and you know I was in control of the the rabies program. I you know had vaccine vaccine drives, um, you know in the community, things like that. Hey, that fits in control of disease. This is how much percentage of what I did uh, fits into that job. Um, so yeah, there's one area right there. Uh, preparation response recovery from natural man-made disasters. We're, we're, we're all kind of have been dealing with that the past year. Hey, I did this with COVID related to animals with my clinic or with the USDA or with, you know, my other industry organization academics that would go there. Um, creation and implementation of policies and regulations. That's specifically a new area that was um, kind of teased out this year. So I, I spent most of my time in, you know, working in the human health field, right? Human public health, but I created policies, impl implemented policies and regulations that fits right there. And that's one of those areas. Areas. So again, three or more areas, it doesn't have to be all six, but it has to be at least, you have to have experience in at least three. So some tips for completing experience tables, spell out acronyms. Um, you know, we all use them, government, military, industry, academics. So spell out acronyms. We have a, a good, you know, uh, representation of the committee, but we might not know exactly what you're trying to, to tell us. So make sure everything you put is clear. 
Um, but you don't have to, again, you don't have to write a dissertation on uh, everything that you did. So be quantitative where uh, applicable. So, hey, I, I managed this, you know, provided herd health for this, this many uh, cattle, this many herds, you know, I, I oversaw this many areas um, that, you know, in a surveillance program, things like that. Uh, another example, so describe the scope and experience by listing the average, uh, th the number and type of animal interactions per week, month, year is applicable. So, hey, I ran the vaccine program for this shelter or for, you know, uh, whatever, or uh, at a lab animal facility, I manage the uh, infection and disease control for this many animals, for this many years as many weeks and that can count towards that will count towards your qualifying experience so also indicate percentage of duties in the vpm areas um, uh, through all the areas so not greater than 100 percent um, but it does not need to equal 100 percent if you're in a job where you know you've worked you know a certain amount of months or a year in a job and you said hey I have done a lot in prevention and, and control of disease, but that's pretty much all I can say. I was a surgeon, um, but I also did this related prevention and control of disease, and it was this percentage of my job, so it was 25%, um, and I did this for a year. I didn't get any of the areas, but I got this area, um, and, and that would count towards one of those three areas in qualifying experience. But if you did, uh, again, if you were at a job and you all you were doing is surgery, um, we cannot count that towards uh, your qualifying experience in the VPM fields. So for training programs in progress, uh, not yet completed and described on the education section. So I'm in an MPH program. I put in education selection. I don't have a diploma to show you, um, but I do, here's my graduation date it will be a separate experience table. So you can list how many credit hours have been completed to date or total required. Um, if it has 100%, but does not need to, if there are not cor courses in an applicable area. So if you're in a full-time master's program and you're going you know, all year long, that counts as a full year. Um, uh, same with if you're, you know, part-time, you're going, you know, school part-time, but the rest of the time you're working in BPM related fields. So we can't double count that, remember, but we, we can count that experience towards qualifying time. So master's, PhD graduate programs, um, get my PhD in epi or I'm getting my doctor of, of public health. Master's doesn't have to be just public health. It can be uh, policy, uh, master's in, you know, uh, public health administration. Um, if you have questions about it, get with a sponsor first to ask them and then feel free to email us and say, hey, I'm doing my PhD in this area. Um, you know, what, what can, can I get your thoughts on that? We'll, we'll review it as a committee. If we have any other questions, we will submit it to the executive board for them to review. Um, for these courses, you do not need to submit a transcript. Um, we get transcripts a lot. We don't, we don't need transcripts. Um, the only time we might request a transcript is if you can't find your diploma, um, it's buried in the attic somewhere, but you have a transcript, um, you can submit that in, in, uh, in uh, lieu of your uh, veterinary diploma. So that table one degree, so we know like, yep, you're a graduate of, a, of an approved um, uh, veterinary school. Otherwise, we don't need transcripts for these MPHs and training programs. So here's that page I was talking about that Dr. Turing made and made all of our lives easier. So there's a checklist. So this checklist, uh, say the applicant application contains the following documents and the order listed. So it tells you exactly what order to put them in. Um, fully completed application, table one, uh, copy of each degree diploma certificate listed in table one, or a copy of license to practice veterinary uh, medicine listed in, in table two. Um, two completed uh, signed reference forms, one completed signed sponsor form. Let me, let me backtrack just a minute. If you listed in table one as, as a degree that you have completed, we do need a copy of that diploma. If it's in progress, we don't need a transcript, but you can, you, you just put that in the qualifying experience that it's in progress. You're going to scan it in a single PDF. Um, once you do that, you submit it um, through the online portal and pay the fee. 
and then it gets into our hands from there. Uh, Dr. Turing will uh, invoice, make sure that it, 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 it shows up, the payment goes through. You've created this profile, because remember, that's the first thing you did to apply for uh, the exam or to uh, uh, find out you know, questions about the college and get these applications was to go and create a profile. You will have a profile here, payment history. It will show up, check, paid. Again, questions, check with your frequently asked questions on the website. Ask a diplomate um, if you know, if you have one that potentially would like to be a sponsor, a diplomate in good standing. Um, and also I recommend talking to some sponsors. So right now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Bickett Weddle and Dr. Doyle on how to optimize an applic applicant's application as a sponsor. So thanks Dr. French. Um my name's Matt Doyle. I can start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Um, as the counselor for ACVPM's credentialing committee and a previous sponsor for candidates applying to take the exam, um, I'd like to share some tips uh, to those of you that wish to serve as a candidate sponsor. So those of you watching um, who are, are already uh, diplomates of the college and some expectations for those of you who are planning on applying to ACVPM and what you could expect from your sponsor. So to start off, you might be asking, we've heard it a couple times, but what does the sponsor do? So I see this as the sponsor has three main responsibilities. They're to help the applicant, to ensure the application package is complete, thus helping the credentials committee, and then to attest to the moral and ethical character of the applicant. So let's go through each of those roles. First, the sponsors, um, first as sponsors, you are there to help the applicant with the application process. You are a diplomate of the college. You've gone through this um, yourself. You can share your experiences and help them through. You can answer their questions or help find the answers since you've more direct access to other diplomates, to the credentials committee, to counselors like myself, to the um, executive vice president, the EVP team. Um, so you can point them to the right resources. You can point them to this recording um, and you can ensure that they have all the information they need to be positioned for success. Second, sponsors as you work with the applicant, review their package to ensure that it's complete and that they provide all of the required information. I encourage you to work with the applicant early in the process to review the information. Um, this can prevent any last minute mistakes. If you're getting to the end of the month when it's due and you find out that the signature isn't available for one of the references, it might take some time to get that signature to fix those mistakes and you might come up to the deadline. So we wanna to try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, you want to make sure everything's filled out completely without typos. Names are provided on all the forms when asked for. References have been signed. Seems to be a big problem with just missing signatures. Um, ensure that the experience section is complete, that it accounts for that four years of time covering at least the three areas of veterinary preventive medicine. Um, and if you have questions on how the wording describes that experience in these forms, you can assume that the credentials committee is also going to have similar concerns. So working with that applicant, you can help them to make sure it is clear and demonstrates the experience that they are trying to tell the credentials committee. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about the package, talk with them about it. Make sure that when you sign off on this application package, that you feel confident that, they, that it is complete and that they've met all the qualifications and they're ready to, uh, to move forward and sit for this exam. Um, once the application is fully put together, I recommend that you as the sponsor sit down with the full package for 30 to 60 minutes and go through with a fine tooth comb to make sure everything is present, everything is accounted for, everything makes sense. Um, so that when the applicant actually puts it into the system, there's not going to be any problems. The longer you spend working with the candidate at the beginning of the process, 
the less problems you're going to have towards the end and have a more successful outcome. Um, and again, if you have questions or concerns, reaching out to the Credentials Committee or the EVP team as a sponsor, they're your resources to make sure that you can get the right information to the applicant. Then the third area of responsibility for the sponsor is to attest to the moral and ethical character of the applicant. So I've seen some questions, people asking like, how is the, it's, it's a subjective measure. And this might be a simpler task if you are personally acquainted with the applicant. Say the person applying is a colleague of yours or a previous vet school classmate um, who you have a personal relationship with. That's the type of, um, of relationship where you know what their character is like and you can sign that form with confidence that this is the type of person you want to join our college. Um, if you volunteer to be a sponsor for someone that you haven't met, that you check the box and said, I'd be willing to be someone's sponsor and you're put together with someone, I recommend that you start this process out with a phone call. Talk to them, learn about what they do, why they want to become a diplomat, et cetera. And as you work through the process, you'll get a better sense of who they are and what their character is like. Um, and then you also have references that, uh, as resources, the two references forms to see what others who know this person are, and you can get a better sense for their moral character. So that's the type of um, work we're kind of expecting there. Overall, open communication with the applicant between the applicant and the sponsor is key um, and will address most of the issues that come up. Um, even if you are familiar with the candidate, it's important to sit down and talk with them. Um, I recommend you walk them through in the beginning all these forms and the whole process, just so you, they, you know that they know what they're getting into. Um, you ensure that they have seen this presentation, for example. Uh, discuss their timeline for completing the application so that you have a realistic expectation that this that all these forms are going to be filled out on time and you'll have time to review them and make sure that everything gets submitted um, appropriately and you're not waiting to the last minute. So gain a sense for that. You might have gotten a sense that the work experience section is probably the area where the applicant is going to have the most questions for you. So discuss the work experience, how it breaks down into those six areas, at least three of them across the board um, in that overall four years of experience in veterinary preventive medicine. Before they get too far in the application process, this will help you feel more confident that they're meeting that requirement. And it's going to help them understand how that they can tailor their experience and describe it so that the credentials committee can see what they've done and how it fits um, in, into our college. Some candidates might find it difficult to find references. So it's important to talk to them, help them figure out who would be best uh, to ask. It's a good idea to counsel them on making sure that who they select as the references are familiar with what veterinary preventative medicine is and what ACVPM is and how their career is fitting into this world so that those references are better understand what they are doing when they're filling out that form, that they know what the goal here is and how, that they, how they can describe their relationship with the candidate. Um, it, it'll make it a simpler process on that end. And then overall, with this open communication, just make sure that you have the opportunity for short phone calls or quick emails throughout um, the, the, the process so that you can keep in touch, build that sense of who that person is and make sure that you're answering all the questions that they have. Um, again, you can always reach back out to the credentials committee and the EVP team to um, get help uh, with anything that comes about. And then um, my final point that I wanna make is for those of you who are diplomates on the call right now, if you're interested in being a sponsor, really that's gonna happen in one of two ways. The first is if you know someone who wants to take the exam, so that friend or colleague who um, has the experience and wants to join you as a diplomat, um, they can directly ask you and you can join, uh, you can help them um, by becoming their sponsor. Or 
if you go into your ACVPM profile, you can go in, into the edit section and there is a box to check for um, your willingness to be a sponsor for uh, applicants that they can look you up in the directory and they can find out that you're someone who is willing to be a sponsor for someone. Um, so you can check that box. There's also the box for being a mentor um, right below that. And I'd encourage you to also consider being a mentor in that as opposed to being a sponsor where you're helping them in the application process, the mentor um, role can help them as they prepare for the exam. Um, you can stay involved as their sponsor throughout, but um, we do have that option as well on, on, on the um, profile page so that you can select those um, as you feel like you can help. Um, and with that, I'll pass the mic over to Dr. Nell beckett Weddle um, for some additional comments. Actually, I'm going to jump in real quick. This is Dr. Okay. Turing. Uh, we're going to launch a quick poll. Uh, just ask uh, our webinar attendees a, a question. We only want uh, prospective applicants to answer this question. After that, Dr. Pickett Whittle will, will talk. Um, and then um, I'm going to tell you the secret of the application process. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to launch the poll right now. Thanks, Dr. Doyle and Dr. Turing for uh, launching it. And he has a good secret, so don't sign off. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about references. And this can become a challenge for folks that maybe are uh, practice owners and they wonder who could be a reference for me. There's a lot of different options. Um, you know, if you don't have a boss, you might have a client or a colleague or one of your professional acquaintances, might be a community leader. Um, someone that can attest to what they've seen of your performance in veterinary preventive medicine. So don't be daunted by that fact. Um, we've successfully had quite a few practice owners um, apply for the exam and more importantly, successfully pass the exam. So when you're thinking about the reference piece of it, start now, maybe tomorrow, and figure out who your two references are going to be. The other thing as a sponsor um, that I answer a lot of questions for is what if those folks don't really get veterinary preventive medicine? So we've gone over those, those six different areas and, and how that pertains tonight. Spend a little bit of time, make a bullet list. What are some of the things that you do in your job that fit under those categories? Now the reference needs to be written by the person who's going to sign in their own hand, not a typed in set of initials. I know that came in as a question, but we need to have a signature on those forms that says, I attest to this information. So signatures are very important um, with all of the programs that are available now. Um, there's all kinds of easy ways to get that on there. So make sure you're thinking about it from the perspective of that position that that reference knows you and give them some examples of how you do that. Might just be a bulleted list, but it's really important that they provide it in their own language, but they might not understand exactly what all is veterinary preventive medicine. So again, that's it's kind of your opportunity to, to work with your reference and give them some time. Again, deadline is August 31. That's not negotiable. Um, so you wanna make sure that you've got adequate time to get that in. Um, another uh, piece that I'll just touch on quickly, I know we're going long tonight, um, is that relevant work experience. And so you've got to convince five strangers, Todd mentioned this, of your qualifications to sit for this rigorous exam. And there's a couple of ways to do that. I'll give you a football example. So you might say, I am a veterinarian and I've been in practice X number of years. Fantastic. Brett Favre, famous football player, right? A lot of people know him. A lot of people know his statistics, but it's a whole lot easier for strangers to see data. And we give you those examples in the application form. So quarterback for the Green Bay Packers started X number of games, threw for X number of passes, X number of interceptions, X number of touchdowns, was in the Pro Bowl this many times, Hall of Fame this, right? Tell us that story. And it's really hard for veterinarians sometimes to tell their own story very well, right? Most of us are pretty humble and don't like to put all those details out there, but this is your one 
one shot. And that's really where the sponsors come in, trying to drag that information out of you. So take a little bit of time and think about a typical week. Think about a typical month. How often are you doing some things? A question came in tonight about um, the section on policy. Can I, can I write them for my clinic? Of course you can, right? If you are establishing a policy, a standard operating procedure, something that convinces other human beings of the right way to do a process, that's policy development. So, but be explanatory in a succinct way. Those are good practice tips for the exam as well. So thank you for your time, Dr. Toring. I know you've got some great secrets to share with the group tonight. I'll turn it back to you. As we go through this process, I, I've been with the ACVPM now for uh, about a year and a half, coming up on two years. Um, and this process is an arduous process to apply for, to prepare yourself, and to um, take the, the board certification exam. But it's a process that hundreds of us have gone through, and uh, it, is, it is definitely doable. I am kind of your guide um, in this process, from the application to the credentialing, uh, to the actually uh, the, the exam process. I, I will be um, with the applicants as they become candidates and candidates as hopefully they become diplomates. So my, my first uh, thing that I would like to, to, to say is, is, you know, download the application, push your keyboard away from the computer and read the application. Many of the questions that we feel, uh, many of the points of confusion are explained very well in the application instructions. So before you type one letter, read the entire application because it is a very detailed application. But uh, once you read the instructions, I, I'm pretty sure you'll, uh, um, you'll understand it. And then how the process goes once you complete your application. Uh, during that process, you can email me, ask questions. If there's something that I can't answer, I will send it to the uh, credentials committee and get their, their uh, feedback. But um, you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Once you submit your application, I do a cursory review. Um, I look at it to make sure it's in the proper order, make sure all the documents are there, make sure that all the signatures are there. And then once that's done, I will send you an email and say, your application's been administratively accepted. We have put an invoice in your ACVPM profile and then once you pay that invoice, we forward the application to the credentials committee for their review. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a detailed process. It's all explained on the ACVPM portal, but it ultimately, you know, questions arise. If you have a question, please feel free to, to email me. I look forward to working with you all. Uh, those that are gonna apply this year, those are you gonna apply in the future. And um, I wish you, wish you all the best. So Dr. French, uh, if we have a couple minutes, I think we've cleared a few of the questions. I do have a good one that regards, uh, or the, regarding to uh, signatures. Someone asked about digital signatures that if a sponsor or um, reference can just type their initials and type their name in as their signature, or does it have to be an actual wet ink signature or something of that sort? Yes, it needs to be um, a, a unique digital signature. Um, uh, yes, so it has to be uh, associated with um, an ID card or, you know, uh, it can be digital and one of those handwritten digital. But yeah, we, we, um, we'll, we will send back references if it's just typed because, again, we're not sure if that's something we, we know that applicants you know, wouldn't do this, but we need to, we'll send back applications if it's just typed. Um, so yeah, a digital signature needs to be a certificate signature or it needs to be a, a, a hand signature. Um, please and thank you. Yeah, and that, and that is one of the things that I will be looking for is signatures. And um, again, I will email you, say, hey, your signatures need to be redone, here's why, um, and allow you to, to resubmit. The only other question that I think, uh, I know Dr. French handled a couple of them uh, with the individuals. Was there anything that you wanted to, was there a question in there that you maybe wanted to cover for everybody, Dr. French, or? Uh, I see they, this They were question. very specific, they were very specific <laughs> questions. 
Yeah, and this is just so you guys know, this is typically what happens. We get some very specific questions. A lot of them um, we'll, uh, we're, we'll put in the FAQs. You can answer, you see in the FAQs. Uh, and yes, Dr. Blake, a sponsor can be a, a reference. You can be a sponsor and a reference. Um, unless that's, that hasn't changed, right, Dr. Bigot Weddle? Yes. Um, so this specific, I'm going to address Dr. Matashaw's question here. So Dr. Matashaw says, hey, I got a passion for veterinary preventive medicine, but I've been a, um, a, a small animal veterinarian for a super long time. Um, and, um, you know, what, what would the application I put forth, would I put forth a good application, even though I've been primarily focused on small animal medicine? So every year, um, we, in the past few years, we've had between, you know, 68 and 96 applicants. We have a handful of applicants that do specific small animal, uh, medicine, um, and that will submit an application that shows in their qualifying experience that they, um, have focused in three or more of the areas of veterinary preventive medicine. Um, and we have, you know, they have, have, have uh, been accepted as, as applicants and, you know, uh, hopefully they went, went forward and passed the exam from there. So, um, so yes, even if you're small animal heavy, if again, uh, this is, is something, you know, you're read up on the website, read up into the college, um, and, and see if, if, you know, this is the, uh, the, the what, what the, the college's values align with, you know, um, what you do as a veterinarian, um, then, you know, feel, feel free to uh, apply, ask those specific questions as you're getting a little bit closer to the application de deadline, especially through your sponsor, through us. Um, but we get that every year. Yes, we've had primarily small animal veterinarians um, uh, submit applications and, and, and every year we, we have uh, some that are accepted uh, as long as they meet that qualifying experience. And they explain to these five strangers that, that they are uh, deserving to sit for the exam. All right, and then one final question that we probably should have done before the poll, but um, you know, question is, in what ways can achieving ACVPM certification benefit your veterinary career you know, for example, what doors can having ACVPM board open up on the civilian side? I would love to answer that question as a civilian. Um, I don't have a military background whatsoever. So um, we do have specialty pay options for um, for those that do. So any, any ABVS, American Board of Veterinary Specialties uh, program, we are one of those. And so folks that do qualify for specialty pay, it is an option. I've never received a dime extra for being a diplomate. Um, it was not part of my job requirement. It didn't necessarily directly benefit me financially, um, but I can tell you I've benefited financially because of it. Um, more opportunities have definitely presented themselves. Um, as a consultant, um, I've gotten projects because I have experience in veterinary preventive medicine. It's very individualized, right? Do people want to do those types of extra things? Um, you know, again, it depends on the individual, but I can tell you when we did our 2019 member survey and asked diplomates, why'd you choose ACVPM? things were all over the board, but a lot of it was, it's a personal goal. And so it's hard to put a dollar value on what that personal goal is. But when you join us, there's about 1100 members between our active diplomates and our emeritus members, and they are from all walks of life. I think when we look at the different categories from our members, we mirror veterinary medicine. And so the question about small animal medicine, I've sponsored small animal veterinarians before who've successfully passed the exam. Now they came in with small animal medicine and maybe a master's in public health degree. Um, so the questions related to large animal medicine maybe were a little struggle for them because it wasn't something that was fresh. We ask a lot of large animal regulatory questions on our exam. So while you might meet the requirements, um, the study piece of it might be a little different for you as it is for everyone, but you will meet some of the most amazing human beings, three of which are my fellow colleagues on tonight's seminar. And you've got opportunities to connect with like-minded individuals and people from all ends of the spectrum. So. I'm biased, I know, but ACVPM affords you tremendous opportunities to grow and 
expand and build your network um, of which can lead to financial benefits for other individuals. So thanks for asking such a great question. Yeah. Yeah. A, a little, little story this week. We had a job announcement come from Australia. They, they asked us to post to our diplomates. They wanted a board certified veterinary preventive medicine uh, individual. Um, we sent it out to the diplomates. And the next day I got an email from them and say, the email you sent out worked. We've got several people interested in our position. So the networking, the opportunities that become available, the education opportunities um, that you would not see if you weren't a, or you would, you may see them, but they wouldn't be as directed towards you um, if you weren't a diplomat. I think that's the end of the questions. Um, um, I do want to thank everybody, uh, particularly our panelists, for their uh, uh, participation tonight. Uh, a lot of good information was, was put out. Um, but I also want to thank uh, the attendee, attendees, uh, both the uh, current diplomates and the potential applicants, um, for being patient with us. Uh, hopefully, we provide you some insight into uh, how to apply for the exam. Uh, some tricks of the, the trade, I guess. And uh, as I said previously, I look forward to working with each of you uh, uh, as we negotiate this, this process. This record, uh, webinar will be recorded, or it has been recorded. I will be posting it to the ACVPM YouTube page in the coming days. Uh, so if you want to go back and listen, see if there's something you missed, please feel free to go to our ACVPM YouTube page. So with that, I thank everybody and uh, everybody have a great evening.